Good thing I had the dial indicator on there so I knew exactly where that end mill was when I scrapped this part. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on the MLA18 die filer today and we're going to do all of the seals and caps and all the other little bits that finish up the base on this thing and we're going to do some tuning and get that mechanism running smoothly and quietly. So, should be fun. Let's go. I'm going to start by making this thing here. This is called the hat. It holds the file in place and also acts to deflect filings away from the mechanism, hence the shape. It's a neat little shape and I'm going to be turning it out of this giant block of steel here that I cut off some round bar. The steel is a little bit oversized, but it's the closest thing I had to a good size for this part, so we'll just make a few extra chips. I'll start by facing off the end, as is tradition. Then I'll turn the outer diameter of this down to the largest diameter of the hat, which is the outer edge of the sloped area there, the tapered section. When you have a lot of chips to make like this, it's a great time to experiment with speeds and feeds because, well, you've got some time to kill and you've got nothing to lose between here and the final dimension. So try taking really heavy cuts and really light cuts and turn the RPM up and down and just see what the cutter does. It's a great way to learn your machine and learn the material. I'm close now though, so I'll do a nice finishing cut. This dimension is not overly critical, but you know, it's good practice to try and hit everyone anyway. Next I'm going to mark off a little area here at the base for the bandsaw, because I know for a fact I'm going to be parting this off with the bandsaw and not the parting blade. This is pretty thick, heavy material, and I don't have a lot of room there around that shoulder for my parting blade. So I'm going to put a little witness mark there. That's my don't go past here because room for saw blade area. Then I'll turn the part from what remains here. Now there's two different orientations for doing this part. One could do it with the little hat part sticking out away from the chuck or the other way around. Doing it the other way, which gives you access to the underside of the part, would allow you to do it in one setup, but you'd have to do the little hat part that I'm doing now with a lot of heavy grooving operations. And that's not something I'm well set up to do. I don't have a grooving tool that would be up to that. So I'm doing it this way, but this does mean I'm gonna need an extra setup. So after turning down the little hat part, I then faced the back side there to make a nice surface there, which turned out to be a big waste of time. And I should have been doing the taper right there, but I didn't and more on this in a second. I then used a file to round the corner there of the hat cause it'll look nice. Now I think I'm ready to cut this off for the second setup. So I took it out of the lathe, which again, this is a mistake, but hang on. And I took it over to the bandsaw and I'm going to set it up with an angle plate in the vise here. This is a trick I've shown before. It's a way to fix your thin, large diameter disc shaped parts in the horizontal bandsaw for cutting like this. So if there isn't a hole in the middle, so you can't bolt it through, then I just feed the saw down and then put a clamp around it like this. Now I can get some oil in there and make the cut. Now obviously the secret to this method is you can't let the saw go all the way through. In fact, you can't even let it go past center. Otherwise that clamp is either gonna pinch the blade or it's just gonna fall off because it loses tension. So the secret to this trick is you stop just short of the center line of the part there, shut the saw off, loosen the clamp, and then rotate the part around and do another cut. Never place your fingers under the blade while you're doing this because the carriage is sitting on the catch there and if it slips off of that, well, it's a good way to lose a finger while you're doing this. But with the part rotated now, I take another cut to, again, not all the way through and not even to the center line. You can do this two or three times depending on the part. The larger the diameter, the more of these you need to do. But for a smallish part like this, just two passes, one on each side is good enough. And each pass is, again, stopping short of the center line. And then I take it over and finish it with the hacksaw. That works very well, actually. Now I can set it up the other way for what I thought would be the rest of the operations. And I'm going to face this down to final thickness here. Once 
Well, great, past me thought. I faced that down to thickness. Now I can go ahead and cut that taper. And this is the moment where I realized the taper needs to go the other way. For some reason, I had that taper reversed in my head, and I thought I was going to do it in this setup, so I should have done it in the previous setup. That's okay, we can recover this. It's just going to cost me a couple of extra setups. There needs to be a counter bore in the bottom of this part anyway, so what I can do is take advantage of that temporarily, and I'm going to center drill, drill, and tap a threaded hole here, a blind hole, not all the way through the part, and I'm going to use this to flip the part back around and mount it on a mandrel. Because the part is so small now, I don't really have a way to hold it back in the original direction again. Then I dug through my bin of old mandrels and I found this one, which is pretty close to what I need. It's got a quarter inch thread on the end of it there, but it's too long, so I went ahead and chopped that off and cut a new short little stubby thread on it to hold the hat. Then I dial in the hat. Even though the mandrel was dialed in, a thread is not going to hold apart concentrically. They have too much tolerance in them. So I dial in the part again. So the mandrel might be running out a little bit, but the part is running true, and that's what matters. Now I can set up my compound here with the protractor there to the correct angle to cut the taper. For tool post angle, I'm splitting the difference between a good lead angle on the surface that I'm going to be creating, the tapered surface, while also making sure I'm going to have clearance on the inside corner there when I get into the hat area there. This is always the way that taper turning goes. You just pick a tool post angle that looks about right. You want the tool square to the surface you're creating in general, but you may also need to cheat it one way or another as needed to get around other features as I'm doing here. From here, it's just a standard taper turning operation. I'm feeding with the compound there, as you can see. And then I'm advancing with the carriage and I'm going until the thickness of the flange there is as specified in the drawing. That's the dimension that they give for this. Drawings vary a lot in what data they give you for tapered surfaces. Sometimes they give you the size of the angled surface. Sometimes they give you the thickness of the remaining flange. Sometimes they give you the thickness at the top of the taper, and so on. In this case, all they give us is the thickness of the base of the flange. So I calculated the angle from that, and hopefully I did the math right, and it works out about right which it looks like it did. Looks pretty good there. Quick side note, there's an optional relief cut that you can do on the underside of this hat area. I opted not to do that after all the other drama I had with this part. With that done, I realized I could make a little lemonade here. Since I've got it mounted on a mandrel anyway, I can skip ahead and do the set screw in the side of the hat area there, because I can use this mandrel to hold it in a collet block. The set screw actually was going to be kind of tricky. I wasn't totally sure how I was going to do it. But uh, this mandrel makes it easy to hold the part, so let's do it now. All these little mistakes on this part are a classic example of a thing that I tend to do, which is I think through the order of operations about three quarters of the way, and I think, all right, I got this. Let's just go make chips. And then frequently it turns out in that last quarter of the part of it that I didn't think through, there's some sort of deal-breaking detail that renders my previous order ideas completely invalid. And that's what has happened here. But hey, a few extra fussy setups later and I'm back on track, and now I can finish the counter bore on the underside here. Next I've got an indicator set up on my tailstock and an end mill and an end mill holder there, and I'm going to give myself a little start here on the counter bore using an end mill. Sometimes two flute end mills don't track very well, as that one did not. You can see it wobbling around there, but that's okay, that's not going to hurt anything. I'm using the indicator here because this depth needs to be quite accurate. If I go a little bit too far, I'll punch through the far side of the part. Or if I mix up the dimensions in my head and do the wrong depth, I will also punch through the back of the part, as I just did. <sighs> Good thing I had the dial indicator on there so I knew exactly where that end mill was when I scrapped this part. Well, now I had a decision to make. I could try to repair this or I could make the part again. Now I've got quite a bit of time invested in this thing already, so I think I'm going to go for a repair instead. You might say I intentionally did this to demonstrate to you that in fact machining mistakes can frequently be repaired. That would be a lie, but you might say that. I found a piece of the exact same steel alloy in the scrap bin, so I turned down a little pin that's going to be a very close fit in that hole that I made with the end mill there. I used a gauge pin on that hole to know exactly how big the end mill made it, and I'm turning this pin here to be just about half a thou over that dimension. So it'll be a light interference fit there. And I'll part that off.
then over to the press here and I'm going to put some Loctite on that little plug that I just turned and I'm going to press this thing into the hat and plug the hole that isn't supposed to be there. And that goes in there very nicely. Now if you want to really make that repair disappear just take a really light facing cut across that surface and the seam between those surfaces will disappear. If you want to see this in action go check out my lathe skills playlist the magic tube video is a project that i showed to demonstrate this effect now i can redo that counter bore with the end mill going to the correct depth this time i'll just double check that here to make sure that i'm at the right depth and now i can come in with the boring bar to finish this out to the final diameter now the cool thing about that repair is that the repaired area is smaller than the final counter bore because i caught it early that means there won't be any shear forces on that joint that is the press fit and loctite joint because the file rod which goes in here like this is sitting on a shoulder that's a larger diameter than that repair area. For a little extra irony that end mill step that caused the error wasn't actually necessary because I forgot there's supposed to also be a hole through the center of this. Not quite as big a diameter as I did with the end mill but the starting hole if I had done it first probably would have been sufficient for the boring bar and I wouldn't have had to do the end mill. But I had to drill that hole now because I forgot. That should be it for this part though. So you can see the little repaired area there if you look closely and the light is hitting it right. It's going to be under the table anyway when it's done so you're never going to see it. Well there's the little hat on there. That set screw is going to hold the hat in place and also holds the file in place once the file is inserted there. And you can see how that goes up and down and deflects filings away from the mechanism. Here's a closer look at that repair. So the little kind of washer that's effectively been inserted into that area is fairly thin, but it's an interference fit and it's loctited and there's no shear forces on that area again because it's a smaller diameter than where the forces are being exerted. So no trouble there at all. That should be a very strong repair. I think that was worth doing rather than remaking the part. Onto this little cap here next. This is made of brass and it holds a felt washer which seals the top of this boss. I'm going to measure the diameter here because I want to match the casting in this area so it'll look nice. But of course the casting is a good 30 thousandths out of round so I'm just going to have to kind of split the difference here. Curiously the drawing does give a dimension for this part but when I hold that up against the boss that's very very small. Looks way too small so I'm not going to do that. Kit does come with these felt washers here. You might think as I did that these are to seal the oil in but actually they're to keep filings out. Those are oversized and will need trimming as well. All right over to the lathe with the brass. I'll face off the end as is tradition. And then I'm going to turn the OD down to the diameter required. I'm going to start a little bit on the large side based on my measurements of the casting boss there. And then I'll do some trial and error here at the end to tune that dimension to something that's going to look good. Got a fair ways to go though. The stock that I found is quite a bit oversized. And so let's make some chips. A number of these brass and steel pieces, the kit does not come with the material for it. So that's why you see me just using whatever I have and potentially making a lot of chips to get down to the parts that I need. Similar to the hat feature, I now need a counter bore on the underside of this to hold that felt washer. So here's that setup again and with a little more detail. So I've got an end mill holder in there and then I've got an indicator set up on the quill. So you can see as I turn the quill, the indicator is going to unwind there. And here's how I set this up to get a really accurate depth. I push the tailstock in until the cutter touches the work. And then I unwind the hand wheel until the indicator reads zero. And that's pushing the tailstock away from the work. And then at zero, then I lock the tailstock in that position. And then I retract the quill to get the cutter clear of the work so that I can start the lathe. And now with the lathe running, as I feed in, when the indicator gets to zero, it'll start cutting and I can read my depth from there. This is very, very easy and quick to set up. And it's really, really accurate. That's just the thing on a part like this where the counter bore has to be a very accurate depth because the remaining material above the counter bore is very thin. So there's not a lot of margin for error here. But as before, I start with the counter bore, which gives me room for the boring bar. And I bring this out to final diameter with the boring bar. So 
that went fine. I kind of botched the surface finish on the underside there. I went too deep on a couple of passes and gouged up the surface a bit. And once again, I forgot that actually there's supposed to be a hole through the middle of this, so the end mill step was pointless anyway, because if I had just drilled the hole first, that would have made clearance for the boring bar. And I probably would have got a better surface finish on the bottom of that bore too. I'm just batting a thousand today. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and ream that for the file rod. I want a close fit on the file rod here because that's, again, supposed to keep the filings out of the mechanism. I'm going to do one more check on the OD of this part. Again, I'm trying to guess what's going to look good on top of the casting, and this looks like it might be a little bit too large. I don't want it to overhang anywhere. So I took a couple more light cuts and checked it again until I had something that seemed like it was going to mostly look good. It's going to be a compromise regardless, again, because that casting isn't round. I'm ready to part this off now. I'm going to part it off to length and take my chances with the parting blade finish on the top of the part. Usually in brass, I do okay here, so I felt pretty good about this. If it's really crucial to get a good finish, you can part the part off extra length and then flip it around and face it down to guarantee a good finish. And Yahtzee. Almost done now. Survey says on that parting blade finish, eh, that could have been better. Yeah, I'll clean that up here in a minute. But first I'm going to set it up on the milling machine to put the bolt circle in it. I just clamped it to a piece of oak here to act as a sacrificial parallel of sorts. Parallelism isn't super critical for some short length clearance bolt holes here, so the dead tree carcass will be sufficient. I centered that up with the spindle mounted indicator and drilled out the bolt pattern. Nothing too fancy here. The only interesting bit are the counter bores, which I did with an end mill. I happen to have an end mill the right size for the cap head screws here. Well, that's all well and good, but I just wasn't really happy with the surface finish on the top of that part, and it is going to be visible because it's the top of the part. So I decided to shine it up a little bit on some 320 grit emery. I worked it at 320, and then I went up to 1,000 and that improved the finish substantially there. That's 28% less embarrassing now. The oversized felt washer needed trimming down to be a nice fit in there. I don't want it to be stuffed in there too much or it'll clamp down on the file rod and create a lot of drag. So let's do a test fit there and see how that goes. That seems like a good fit on there. And I think I'm happy with the fit on the boss there. That seems to be running well. No issues there, so let's move on. Next up is the back plate. The kit comes with this large casting for the purpose. The casting is intentionally extra thick so that you can hold it in a four jaw like this. So that is what I'm going to do. It's just barely thick enough to do this. It's a little close, but we can do it. I started by dialing in the outside of the casting there, figuring that would be close enough, and then I faced down the bolt circle area there. The center is going to remain rough cast, as is a traditional look. While I was facing this though, I noticed the center area there was running out a lot, and if I then go and turn the OD and then make the bolt circle, the bolt circle risks looking crooked on the final part because the unmachined area in the center isn't in the center of the final part. So luckily I caught this and I was able to catch the edge of it with my dial indicator there and I dialed in that little depressed area there in the middle. And that looks much, much better. That's running true now. As is always the case with castings, for aesthetic reasons, it doesn't actually matter what the outside of the casting is doing. What matters is what the unmachined areas of the casting are doing relative to the surfaces that you're going to be creating with the machining. You want the unmachined areas to be concentric with your final surfaces. I was aiming for a couple of thou under the opening that this goes into just to make sure it's kind of easy to slide it in and out. I ended up uh, about a thou and a half under, so it's going to be a little close, but we'll see here. Give it a little test fit on the casting. And yeah, that seems okay. It's definitely a close fit, but I think it's going to be okay. Now I can flip it around, and I've got copper shims there to protect that machine surface, and we can face off the area that was being used to hold onto the part. This is a nice thought on this casting. A lot of model engine kits, what they do with parts like this, like cylinder heads, is instead of making the entire casting extra thick, they just give you a cast mandrel on the back to hold onto. 
I kind of prefer that because facing off all this extra thickness was a lot of chips and quite a bit of time. When I'm getting close to final thickness, I'm checking for the thickness here with this micrometer that'll fit in behind the jaws there, but I'm also interested in the parallelism of the part. So to check this, I measure the thickness in four places. Parallelism isn't very important on this because it's just a cap, but it's a good exercise to go through anyway, so I'll show you how this works. You can see on one axis here, I've got six thousandths of error. There's six thousandths of extra thickness on one side. Then on the other axis, I've got about two thousandths. You might be surprised that this happens, given that the part is tapped against the faces of the chuck jaws, which should be a parallel reference. But the reality is, on a budget-priced four jaw like this, the internal tolerances on those jaws just aren't good enough to be repeatable, so you really can't trust them. However, it's a poor machinist who blames their machines. If you understand the fundamentals of what you're doing, you can get good results out of mediocre equipment. Starting with the area with the largest error then, I put the dial indicator on the spot that's too thick, and then I want to move the part closer to the indicator by half that error. I've got six thousandths of error here, so I'm going to move it three thou towards the indicator. I actually landed about two and a half. I tend to be a bit conservative on these corrections. And now you should see the indicator running out on the face in a direction that's opposite what those numbers are saying. Then the other axis actually corrected itself when I did that, which often happens. Then I take another light cut and I check it again. Make sure that cut is deeper than the worst of the error was. And I go through that exercise again. And now I'm within a thousandth in one direction and within two thousandths the other direction. So I took out most of the error there. Now, if parallelism was really critical, like if this was a chuck backing plate, something like that, then you'd keep doing this exercise over and over until you got rid of all of that error. But a thou or so of error on parallelism is more than sufficient for a little end cap like this, so I'm going to stop there. Once the error is corrected, then resume facing down to thickness. To finish this up, I've got just enough room to get my chamfering tool in there, just barely. So I'll go ahead and put a little chamfer on that inside corner and make it a little more pleasant to install the cap. All right, that's it for the lathe. Over to the mill now. Same setup as I used for the brass cap. The only difference here is I'm using three clamps and I'm indicating in just the surface that I can reach there. And I'm gonna have to do this in two phases because of course the clamps are covering a couple of the holes. So I did all the ones that I could reach, all three operations. Then I moved the clamps and did the remaining set of holes in a second batch. As long as you have three clamps on the part and you move them one at a time, such that you always have two clamps in place, then the part won't move while you do this. Quick test fit here. That's definitely close fitting. Eh, probably a little too close, but you know, it'll look nice. And I was trying to get it to be a little bit thinner than sitting flush because I want to leave room for a gasket underneath it. So to that end, let's go ahead and make that gasket now. This is the Felpro paper gasket material that I use for steam engine cylinder heads and stuff. It's really good stuff. And I'll cut this out and use my hole punch to punch out the bolt holes. And uh, hey, the hat looks like a pretty good size to remove the center. So I'll go ahead and do that too. Gaskets, I think, seal better if there's no center in them because they can adapt locally to the conditions of the surface better if they're not competing for the opposite side of the gasket for where it wants to sit. Second test fit then with the gasket in place. And actually that looks pretty good. With all the bolts tightened down, it sits pretty much flush. As flush as it can with a very rough casting anyway. So I'm pretty pleased with that, I think. Here's a little test drive with all the new parts. You'll notice the ticking noise from the previous video is gone. I did a little tuning in there. Turned out the slide block inside the yoke was about a thousandth too thick, which was preventing the yoke from sitting on the face of the crankshaft properly, causing it to rock back and forth and make a noise. So everything's running quietly now. Things are a little tighter than they were now that I've tuned up those clearances, so it's going to need a bit of running in. It doesn't freewheel quite as well as it did, but I think once it runs in, in this condition, it's going to be much quieter running than it would have been if I'd left it the way it was. And of course, there's no oil in anything either yet. Really, all this thing is missing now is a table. But that is all the time I have for you this week. I hope you enjoyed the making of all these little seals and caps and things. Some surprisingly interesting operations in there, I thought. Well, thank you very much for watching. Thanks especially to my patrons who make all of this content possible. And I will see you next time.